Good evening. I'm Steve Walsh. I'm the military reporter at KPBS in San Diego. Uh, this is our series on race in the U.S. military. Today's topic is how the military attempts to root out supremacy. A military time survey released this February shows that more than one third of all active duty troops and more than half of minority service members say that they have personally witnessed examples of white nationalism or ideologically driven racism within the ranks in recent months, a higher percentage than previous years. Historically, these groups are motivated uh, uh, to target the military, wanting access to the skills and prestige associated with military service. To talk about this for the hour, we have Tony McAleer. He was once a neo-Nazi, he, but he has since founded Life After Hate in 2011 to help others leave white extremist groups. Last year, McAleer testified before a House subcommittee as part of a hearing on confronting white supremacy. Carter Smith is a professor at Middle Tennessee State University. He has taught classes on recognizing white supremacy. He has uh, followed these groups since he was with the U.S. Army Criminal Investigations Division, or CID. And Heidi Barrick, she's co-founded the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, which focuses on international white supremacist, anti-immigration, anti-Semitic, and anti-government movements. She has written extensively on the topic of global hate groups. Until recently, Barrick was also a senior executive at the Southern Poverty Law Center. And Cameron McCoy, he is a lieutenant colonel with the U.S. Marine Reserves. He is also a professor at uh, at, of U.S. Diplomatic and Military History and Race Relations at the United States Air Force Academy. He's also written his thesis on the slow integration of African Americans into the Marine Corps. We're going to start with Cameron McCoy. So take us through some of the history here, Cameron. Uh, what is it about the, the culture of the Marines and the other services, for that matter, that make it easier for these groups to operate? Why would leadership historically be less likely to see these groups as a threat? What's their blind spot? Well, the blind spot, for, first I want to thank you for having me on and, and thank Certainly. you for putting together this panel. But well, one of the blind spots that happens in the Marine Corps, it's very difficult to say that it is a blind spot because this was something that had occurred on an executive level for the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So an executive order that you would receive from the President of the United States, a letter of instruction was akin to that. It was equal to that. And so when the Marine Corps at that time, it was Thomas Holcomb who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps. He had letter of instruction 421. Let, let, let me uh, let, just stop you there for a second. And some of the history here is that the Marine Corps was not particularly excited about the uh, uh, bringing African Americans into the Corps. Back in World War II, there was a tremendous amount of reluctance, right? And, and it's kind of continued on in one way or another since then, right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And that's where the letter plays a key point because it gave full um, carte blanche authority to every white Marine, not just white officers, but white Marines, because it was in line with, at the time, uh, Jim Crow laws. So it was written in the exact same fashion. And so that culture continued to not just emanate, but continue to grow. And, and so it's, it's, and really um, African-American Marines were not really even well accepted even after World War II, correct? What, um, what, what's the history there? Well, you have to look at it. All of a sudden, my turf as a, as a white Marine is being infringed upon by someone who has always been oppressed and suppressed throughout the nation's history. And so to now bring them into the Marine Corps in 1942 and then say they're on equal footing seemed to be an aff a direct affront to what white supremacy was at the time. But that, the issue was this, Steve, is that they weren't even on equal footing because they were still segregated at the time. And then after World War II, um, that was still an issue, right? Um, yes. African-Americans, because basically of World War II, were allowed to be in the Marine Corps for the first time. Uh, but then afterwards, they, they were not particularly welcome, correct? Uh, that is correct. But, and even with President Truman passing Executive Order 9981, which called for the desegregation of the armed forces, it still was a slow ball rolling because the Marine Corps continued to look for reasons as to 
well, we'll allow them to integrate, but there wasn't any urgency there until Korea hit. And once Korea hit in 1950, that's when the urgency uh, came to bear. And, and they simply needed more troops to fight in Korea and then, then a lot more troops to fight in Vietnam. Absolutely. And so this process, this interwar period until Korea, what you see is Black Marines are then trying to get into these coveted spaces. And that is a big deal. It's just, a, it becomes about space. And the officer corps is the most coveted space within the Marine Corps, especially during this time. And that is, that is a lot of heartburn because now you have a lot of young black men who have gone to college, who are now educated, who have gone to law school, and some who even gone uh, into other professional education levels close to getting their uh, doctors. And this seems to be a threat to many white officers because they feel themselves being surpassed. Hmm. Is in some ways is is the military kind of a private club? Oh, that is a very very good question. I it's difficult for me to say that it is a private club because it is open for the entire public. However, there are specific enclaves within and specific segments within uh, each military branch that have been viewed somewhat as exclusively white okay. and that I mean, and that began by during the civil war period because fighting on the front lines one was the face of a military branch um, i like to use the term face of the franchise to use a sports analogy because it really does ring true to people understanding okay we're now taking pictures of black people and brown people storming beachheads and demonstrating masculinity and the most uh, at, at the zenith of, of masculinity and what that means and why should that person now be denied citizenship if they are on the front line and doing and, and taking part and doing the things that really do cement what it means to be an elite citizen in the United States. Hmm. So I did a podcast called Free the Pendleton 14. It was about a group of Klansmen operating openly at Camp Pendleton in San Diego back in 1976. The Marines didn't seem to take the threat of the Klan being there very, very seriously. Um, officers were, were more concerned about African-American Marines congregating together to talk about issues like the Klan operating openly there on, on the Marine base um, than they were actually about the Klan themselves. W was that unusual? No, no, not at all. I mean, it was for, for young black men at that time, especially in the 60s, if they even talked about just the nation of Islam, and, and many of these young men be, were becoming Muslim, that was more of a threat. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with uh, J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO, and that continued to emanate throughout just the entire federal government, but many, many, many white Marines were Klan members themselves. And so if you look like me and supremacy is the way of life, then I will be complicit in, in that behavior that would keep any other race or ethnic group uh, down who's inferior. Yeah. So I just, it's to kind of complete the story. It was back in 1976, African-American Marines uh, attacked what they thought was a Klan meeting happening in their barracks. Turns out the meeting was next door. This became national news. David Duke came to San Diego. So we're talking about some of these new groups that are emerging, but this isn't a new phenomenon at all in the, in the military, correct? Oh, no, not at all. And um, yeah, you and I had a conversation a few months back about this very thing. And it has pushed not simply just the Secretary of Def I mean, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who then banned all Confederate paraphernalia off, off of all bases. And then it is now, you know, with the death of George Floyd, uh, even pushed the Secretary of Defense to do the same thing. And even now, um, I know at least in the Marine Corps, effective September 1, 2020, there is no longer the use of photographs for promotion boards or schools or uh, mm -hmm. for command. So they're trying, to, they're trying to get a handle on these issues even, even today. So, Absolutely. 
So I wanted to bring in some more military voices into the conversation, especially people who have seen evidence of hate groups in the ranks, either recently or in the past, as well as take any of your questions. So please hit us up in the chat, chat and in the Q&A. In the meantime, um, I, I want to reach out to uh, uh, Kim Young McAleer. Uh, she's uh, she's lieutenant commander in the United States Coast Guard. She was recognized by the uh, National Whistleblower Center in 2019 after exposing issues around race and gender discrimination in the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Do we have do we have Kim? Hey, Kim. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. All right. So briefly, tell us a little bit about your story. What happened to you at the Air Force at the Coast Guard Academy? Uh, well, first, uh, just thanks for a welcome into the, uh, the conversation. Um, so I'm currently active duty in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I reported into the Coast Guard Academy as a permanent faculty member in 2014. And um, basically what I experienced on a daily basis was workplace bullying, harassment, uh, discrimination. And as I filed those complaints, and these were uh, misconduct by superiors, and as I filed those complaints, uh, the behaviors actually escalated. Uh, and, and I inevitably kept filing additional complaints, behaviors escalated. Uh, I ultimately was retaliated against and I had a, a filed a complaint to the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General's office and uh, they substantiated my claims, uh, not only of retaliation, but I actually went back and looked at how the Coast Guard actually mishandled all of my previous uh, investigations and essentially swept it under the rug. Uh, to this date, unfortunately, uh, no one has been held accountable and I think it really just speaks to this theme of institutional racism, of white supremacy, and how we have these power structures in, in the armed forces that are really working against uh, you know, our, our best and our, and our brightest. Uh, so it was really a journey from 2014. And for anyone who's ever blown the whistle in every sense of that word, you know, there's really kind of an indefinite tail end of, of retaliation in a form of social isolation and, and damage to your reputation, being blacklisted and iced out and things like that. So, uh, but, but thank you for at least allowing me to share, share a little no, bit of that. I appreciate that. And so we, we were talking about the Klan, this is 1976. And then we're talking about some of these issues certainly happening today here. And, um, you know, we, we mentioned at the top of the show, military time survey, this is about a third of troops have seen some sort of extremist activity. And recently, this is a, a, a very recent survey. Um, but still, I, and we're going to find out a little bit later as we talk to some of our experts, is there have only been a small handful of, of actual prosecutions out there. Does that surprise you at all? No, it, it, it does not surprise me personally. Um, just my own observations, what I've seen in, in the Coast Guard and the military is that there's really um, kind of this culture of, uh, uh, in DHS, we say, you know, if you see something, say something. But unfortunately, it's, it's at times, you know, a see something, say nothing. And there's really this culture of, of bystanderism. And, you know, I can speak to that, you know, personally, you know, in the, in the six years of, of workplace abuse that I've seen, and also just kind of the parallels of what we're seeing with respect to, say, sexual assault. Uh, there, there's a lot of, of, of studies that have been done and surveys that have been done, and it's typically always underreported for a lot of those same reasons of, you know, folks not wanting to, to intervene, not wanting to get involved, or there's fear if you come forward. And so I think that's really how a lot of these power systems really function is really keeping people in really kind of fear mindset. Uh, and then, you know, things become unreported. And I'm sure you've probably heard about the example in a Coast Guard uh, with a Lieutenant uh, Christopher Hassan who was uh, arrested. Uh, and, you know, for a lot of folks who may not know the full background, but he actually was a Marine Corps veteran. Right. And he, uh, you know, was no three, was a Lieutenant, but, you know, he's, he's at Coast Guard headquarters, right? Right. And he was uh, convicted of drug and gun charges. Prosecutors say that he was a domestic terrorist with a plot to mm. kill several high ranking government officials. Um, uh, he had been in the Coast Guard for for years. And you actually talked to some people who uh, in the Coast Guard who had contact with them and and had heard some of the things that he was saying in regard to race. And and he was he considered himself a racist even before he joined the Coast Guard, I believe. So what, what did you hear? 
Uh, yes, and it, honestly, it was it was after the headlines had already come out after he was already arrested, and of course, you know, people were talking about it in the cub cubicles and whatnot, and someone had basically remarked saying that they had recalled him uh, mentioning uh, comments about like being a skinhead uh, in previous years, and I, and I remember just kind of asking like, well, you know, did anyone say anything back then? So, you know, again, it's 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 really just kind of this culture of. Is it safe to intervene? Do people have the, the competence to intervene? Do they understand what uh, extremism looks like? Uh, so, but, but yes, I, I have uh, interacted with people who had served with him previously. And, and so they saw something, but they said nothing. Th that was how they relayed the story, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. And how does that make you feel as an African-American who's in the Coast Guard, that somebody would have saw something, but then decided that it wasn't worth bringing to anyone's attention? I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's <laughs> whether you're seeing, you know, whether it's harassment, sexual assault, bullying, extremism, you know, all of these things are horrible. So, I, I mean, as a black woman, it doesn't make me feel, you know, safer serving in, in the armed forces. I, I'm going to try to get one of the questions from the audience out there. It's, it's, one of my neighbors was on the naval ship uh, USS Kitty Hawk, that was an aircraft carrier, when uh, there was a race confrontation with white sailors attacking black sailors. This happened in the, actually, it was in the very early 1970s. Um, how does this, is this, how is activity like this still tolerated in the armed forces? Is there a problem with the leadership being racist or is I see no problem with racism or is racism gone covert um, where it's just simply not noticeable by leadership? Uh, Cameron, do you want to take that real quick? It's, it, it's kind of tricky. Like it's, it's not as neat as we'd like it to be. Uh, many times it's, just implicit bias and sometimes it's it's more covert than anything else given again it goes back to you, the first thing you mentioned which is culture if i cannot see someone who looks who looks like me it's very difficult for me to treat them the same way that i was and what i mean by that is i could see that play out uh in so many areas while while on active duty where you could just see if you look a specific way, you got treated one way. And if you didn't look that way, you were treated a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens a lot. If I don't see any generals, black generals in the Marine Corps, then it's very difficult for me to aspire to try to get there. And it's very difficult for even senior officers to recognize that because they are not accustomed to seeing it. I, I don't think anyone's really to blame or if there's something specific, they're antagonistic about it. That's really hard. It's very hard for me to measure that. Uh, but I, I can measure discrimination very easily. And I can see that in the award system, the promotion system, assignment of command. Uh, I've just seen it. And, and just recently with Hel um, Helen Cooper's article about the Marine Corps lacking black generals uh, really has sh shined a light on that. Okay. I, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to our, our, our next guest here. Well, unfortunately, she's, she's an important guest here. Um, we, I just got to make sure I'm, I'm keeping on with my hour here. So we're going to bring in, uh, in Heidi Barrick, who, uh, who is, actually had recently been with the Southern Poverty Law, uh, and now she's with the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism. Now, you recently testified before a subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee about the emerging threats White supremacist and extremist activity isn't new, as we've just been talking about, but there has been an increase. What, what are we seeing now? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for having me. This is a, it's a real treat. I mean, basically what's happening is we have had a series of arrests. You mentioned just a minute ago the Coast Guard um, person who was arrested for threats of white supremacists who were active duty, also a lot of veterans who are involved in a lot of extremist groups. And, and the groups that are most worrying today where we're seeing these active duty troops are organizations like Atomwaffen, which means atomic weapons in German. This is a neo-Nazi outfit. Another group called the BASE, which is actually the translation of the term Al-Qaeda into English. And these are organizations that believe that they need to use violence to accelerate the collapse of American society. And, and so it's a real scary situation and we don't want these folks to have you know, military training. All right, 
So, yeah, and we're going to kind of untangle a little bit of that just so we can give people a, a taste of some of the groups that are out there. And, you know, bottom line is it's incredibly scary. Um, but most of us really it, weren't focused in on these groups until Charlottesville in 2017 with Unite the Right uh, movement, that uh, rally, that, that was kind of a wake up call for, I think, for most of us who hadn't seen that many uh, extremists in one place at one time. Um, but it, and that really did kind of shine a light on it. And, and some of the groups that we saw out of there were, and you mentioned them already, Adam Waffen Division. Who are these people? What are they, what are they advocating for? Well, I think Charlottesville was a wake up call even for those of us who study extremism, right? Because it was such a shocking um, situation. So we have these new neo-Nazi groups um, like Adam Waffen and the base that I mentioned that are small cellular organizations all across the country and actually internationally. They recruit heavily from active duty troops or from veterans, they want military skills. But I should say that even though Charlottesville came as such a shock as we've already heard you, uh, Steve and Cameron talk about, groups like the Ku Klux Klan, the Neo-Nazi National Alliance, which if we were talking 20 years ago would have been the scariest group out there with the most long track record of violence, uh, they have all targeted military folks into their ranks. So although these groups right now, like Autumn Waffen, are scary because they, they specifically go by the way of the gun and want to destroy democratic societies, it's not necessarily new, but there sure does seem to be a whole lot more of it today. Right. And, and we did see out of Charlottesville some active duty um, troops who were prosecuted after Charlottesville, correct? That's right. And a couple other groups that I haven't really mentioned here have had leadership that were either veterans or active duty members of the military. Um, and, and, we, and, you know, I've only mentioned a few groups. We have quite a few other formations where there have been arrests lately, for example, of the Boogaloo Boys, which I know sounds completely bizarre, <laughs> but it's a kind of anti-government slash racist outfit who, whose members were um, involved, or really somebody who identified as a boogaloo boy, were involved in the killing of cops out in California during the um, Black Lives Matter protests. This is right up in Oakland, California. That's right. And, and these two men who identified as boogaloo boys met on Facebook, and 24 hours later, they engaged in these killings. And that one was an active duty airman. And... and the Boogaloo Boys are part of this, but there's something called the accelerationist movement. And, and as much as we were seeing out of Charlottesville, this seems to be, these groups seem to be kicking it up a notch even beyond what we saw in 2017, correct? What are, what are the accelerationist movement? What do they want to do? So the, the term acceleration refers to accelerating the destruction of a democracy. And, and what these groups broadly believe is that demographic shifts and changes in the United States, which, which eventually will lead to um, a majority minority population in the United States will be far more diverse. They want to stave any possibility of those kinds of changes happening by using violence. And they're specific about it. They've given up on politics as a solution for you know, political issues. And, and these are the kinds of people that we've seen killing people lately, um, for example, in these protest movements or attempting to. And this is, I mean, and I don't want to be flip, but it really is a situation where they look at like The Walking Dead, the show about the zombies and post-apocalyptic world and think like that, that's what we want. We want to tear everything down and then rebuild society somehow in, in their image. And so they really don't care about the political process. They don't care who's president of the United States or who is running Congress. They really do want to just sort of watch the world burn. Yeah, that's right. And it, sometimes it does have a video game sort of TV feeling to their, their dystopian fantasies. But of course, from their perspective, everything that we have is evil and corrupt and tainted. Oh. And we need to get back to a society that's run by, you know, basically white males. They think of, you know, glory times in the past as being what the U.S. should return to. And they, the only thing they can see is the destructive of this, you know, destruction of this corrupt environment to get there. And even though they're, you know, to be frank, not, it's not likely that they're going to succeed, the fact that they simply want to create chaos makes them incredibly dangerous. That's right. And they've killed, you know, mass attacks, major deaths, right? The El Paso Walmart shooting, 
Christchurch, New Zealand mosque shooters, the, the, the shooter, these are the kinds of people who are motivated by accelerationist ideas. And unfortunately, it seems like those kinds of mass casualty attacks are accelerating in, and more rapid than they were in the past, especially if you look at, say, plots that have been interrupted that could have played themselves out. And, and you know, we're going to see a lot more of this. And th this is an area where the military really needs to take a stand because we don't want veterans or active duty uh, folks being involved in things like this. So we have a question from the audience. How much success have these groups had recruiting military troops and uh, how are they doing it? And, and why are they successful? Well, it's hard to know exactly how many, for example, active duty folks are in these groups because we only find out when they've been arrested, right? These aren't organizations that are gonna put their membership lists out there. That said, there have been you know, a handful of more of arrests in, in various accelerationist groups where it turned out that the people who were arrested and many times in leadership positions were either in the guard, active duty serving military or veterans. So that means there's some kind of dovetailing. I mean, obviously these are small groups and we have you know, more than a million people under arms. We have to consider that fact, but still they are, getting, they are getting some folks in there. When it comes to veterans, I think the numbers are a little bit more intense. For example, the militia movement in the United States is probably 25% veterans according to experts. Okay. And we haven't even mentioned, um, mentioned the Proud Boys. There's, I know there's a, there's a California, the California National Guard is actually investigating a troop that had a, a Proud Boys logo on his military vehicle and then posed for it and put it on social media. And he had been uh, patrolling the civil unrest in LA back in June in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, but the Proud Boys, um, are, are, are in one of these groups that has just sprung up, it feels like overnight. Yeah, the Proud Boys have only been around for a few years. Uh, once again, rapidly anti-Muslim, strains of white supremacy, and you know, very aggressive in terms of being involved in street protests. I mean, they on their own, bef before the social justice protests started, if you'd gone a year back further, they were cr creating havoc in places like Portland, and uh, other cities on the West Coast with their own activities, their own um, protests. And you bring up a really interesting point. The Boogaloo Boys, the Proud Boys, um, uh, these groups haven't been around very long. You know, they're, they're much younger than Charlottesville, which happened in 2017. So we can see uh, white supremacy and sort of similar extremist groups are getting a lot more hardcore uh, and quicker. And they, they've learned how to organize and organize very quickly without a lot of, uh, um, without a lot of just network around them. And explain how that works, how these groups come together so quickly to pull off this a violent event. Well, we can thank social media, frankly. I mean, Charlottesville, people probably forget, was organized on a Facebook page. And although the social media companies have, have taken some hate and extremist material down, they're far from having cleaned that up. The scary case, which I already mentioned, were the two Boogaloo boys who killed two cops in California and literally met 24 hours before on a Facebook page. So social media lets you connect with like-minded people really fast and even organize activities. We've seen counter protests to the Black Lives Matter protests put together in less than 24 hours on Facebook pages. And this is probably also how they are drawing military folks into their ranks, right? Because it allows you to do outreach that's surreptitious and somewhat anonymous if, if you so choose. And so you can get in touch with people in a way that we really in the history of the world could never do before. And, and then it happens in, incredibly quickly. Um, we have a question from the audience. Uh, what are uh, people in the white supremacy groups using to convince vets and active duty members to join? What's, what's the lure, the hook? In fact, we'll be talking to Tony here in just a second about this, but what is the hook? And, and what does the military do to try to keep these folks out? Well, the hook is our grievances, people who are upset with the situation. They may have come into the service wanting to get military skills and already had some racist beliefs. I mean, there's a whole set of things that can suck people in and Tony can talk about that um, in depth. Uh, at this point, the military needs to do a whole lot of things to keep these folks out that they're not doing. They need to have better screening you know, processes at the front end. They need to check social media accounts. 
And I think there are a lot of reforms that need to be made to make sure that this issue of rooting white supremacists and other extremists out of the military is front and center because we just, we don't want to unleash folks like this with those skills on, um, you know, the public. And, and we're going to circle back at near the end of the, of the hour here and look specifically at solutions. And I think there were, uh, when you testified before Congress, you had a number of solutions and there were a number of solutions um, that came up. But we'll, we're going to circle back and uh, right now we're going to bring in uh, Tony McAleer. Um, Tony uh, spent 15 years in the white supremacy neo-Nazi movement in, in Canada and the U.S. He was once a disciple of Tom Metzger. Uh, folks in California may know him. He was the neo-Nazi based out of Fallbrook, California. Tony, Tony now spends his life trying to pull people out of the white supremacist movement. So uh, I asked this of Heidi. I'm asking you, Tony. So what, what are people looking for? How do they get sucked into, these, into the white supremacist movement? Well, I think um, certainly it, it's fueled by um, a sense of grievance, a perceived grievance, as, as Heidi mentioned. And I think people are drawn more for a sense of identity and a sense of belonging and, and um, a sense of brotherhood and community and, and a sense of purpose greater than themselves. Um, and I think the white supremacist groups, and I remember I was a, I was a recruiter, uh, are very good at exploiting those grievances and providing a false sense of the of that purpose and and sense of community and sense of belonging and mm. and I think that's what draws it's 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 counterintuitive, but it's the ideology is certainly a factor, but it's not the primary the primary factor, but it's the pill you have to swallow in order to to get those needs met and the, for young people growing up in um you know with challenging childhoods and stuff they come out with with those are the vulnerabilities and and it's those vulnerabilities that are easily exploited by people who are like I was. Yeah, well tell, give me a little bit of your story. So I kind of jumped right in there. How did you lured into the white supremacist movement? Um, I, you know, I wasn't from a broken family <clears throat> or a poor family. I came from a very affluent middle upper class family. My father was a psychiatrist. I went to uh, private schools and such. And, and there was things that happened in the, in the home. I walked in on my father with another woman and, and I started acting out at school as a result of that in the Catholic school. Uh, beat me if I didn't get an A or a B, and it really sent me down a path where I was I was really angry, confused, and and such. And I just want to be clear: I don't ever blame anything on my childhood. There's lots of people that went to Catholic school and got beaten, and lots of people had adults <laughs> in, in the household. The reason I share that I, I <clears throat> to understand the lens through which I made my choices, and and you know when I was in that you know for example when I was in that office getting hit hit on the rear end with a yardstick over and over and over again. I don't think I don't think there was ever a time even to this day that I felt as powerless as I did in those mm -hmm. moments. And so when I first came across the skinheads in England and my parents were like, How, what, what's the attraction? And I was attracted to the violence and the power of violence because I wasn't a tough kid. I was sort of a weak kid. And, and you know, for, for me, for people to be afraid of me was incredibly intoxicating. And and they the skinheads had the one thing that I didn't have. I had and and that was was fear and power and, and perceived power and through through violence. And that's really what drew me in at the beginning. And then those things were exacerbated. I got attention and more a greater sense of power the more far to the right into the more in, in, into the neo-Nazi scene that I went until I found myself as a, a leader exercising power through people. So we have a question from the audience uh, for Tony's. Um, are formers like yourself making a difference or are, they not, are there not enough of people like you speaking up about the potential violence of these groups? That's a, that's a great question. There's certainly not enough qualified formers to sort of be in this space doing the work that we're doing to make it a, 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 a sizable dent into the this the scale of this problem and so how do we how do we scale up and i think where formers are most 
uh, valuable, I think, is taking the the what we've learned, taking how we've learned to work with people coming out of these movements and using existing resources in the community, whether it be the county or law enforcement or, or um, counselors, social workers and that type of thing and, and teaching already existing infrastructure and how to deal with this problem and, and educate them on so that you know, there's the old saying, give a person a fish, they eat for a day, teach a person a fish and they, they feed a whole village. And I think that's where I think we can, if we think of that only formers are, are the solution to this, um, we're simply not enough. Okay. Now, um, the heads of, uh, of, of military law enforcement, they, they spoke before Congress just a couple of months, months ago, and they talked about the number of cases, and it's not that many. And we'll, we'll talk to Carter Smith a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but what they do is if they get a complaint that doesn't rise to the level of being what they see as a crime, they hand the information, what they found out about that particular troop back to their commander, and it's up to them to... Uh, to take action. And I, you know, my question, my question to the military, but my question to you is, is if you're that commander who um, gets a, some information from CID or NCIS and it says, um, this, this person has been interacting with the Proud Boys or the Boogaloo Boys or any of these other groups, he's been on this many websites, he's been doing this. Um, as a commander, how would you approach that, you know, how would you approach it? Uh, that's that's a good question, and you know the Canadian military is is struggling with exactly the same the same issues. And I know recently they came out um, with uh, a very strong policy um, on and defining that that behavior, which doesn't meet the threshold of criminal behavior, but is unacceptable to the military. Defining what that is. And then adding accountability to that, so that uh, commanding officers and officers at different level, they they have they're accountable for what happens under them, and and uh, you know defining what the problem is, and then adding accountability so that people can't just whitewash it and hope it hope it goes away. But I think I think they need to be educated on on what exactly it is that they're looking for and why it's why it's a problem. And I think once and once that and the accountability is thrown in we might be able to see some solutions work. Do you think it should be, there should be a zero tolerance policy that if you've been on these websites, if you've been interacting with uh, an ex a known extremist group that um, there's no place for you in the, in the military? That's a, that's a difficult one to say. I mean, wh what about a guy who's, he's been in 10 years and it's a career and he visited three websites. Do you end his career over that? I, I don't know that it's not for me to define the policy. I think we have to look at, at clearly defining what's acceptable and what, what's not acceptable and to navigate through those, through those gray areas. But if they are in fact involved in meeting and that's what this is, should be zero tolerance. And, and how does a commander know that? Well, if you go ahead, counsel that commander, you've got somebody, they've, they've said something to a coworker that's really troubling. They've been on a couple of these websites. I, how do you go through and determine whether how serious that is? And, and if it is somebody that's maybe just starting on that road, what do you say to them to try to, to maybe bring them out of that? Well, first of all, I would say that there needs to be perhaps resources of specialists that know this stuff inside out that the, the commander can defer to. I've got the, a unit with inside the military that that's all they do. Um, Carter, <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> and then take it from there because some you're going to come across some cases where it's it, it isn't black and white and it is nebulous and you know it's not an easy decision to yeah. make from a commanding officer point of view. We need to bring in resources and you know the first thing I do when I, when I talk to someone um, that it, that is going down this path is try to understand what their grievance is you know often they they have very legitimate or perceived legitimate grievances where they go with those grievances is completely offside and i think people are redeemable and i think that's the 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 choice that the military needs to make is is a person not not everyone i mean everyone has the potential to be redeemable not everybody wants to be redeemed um and i think they're there should be at least some opportunity if it's just a small infraction to be able to come back into the fold if it's something like that. 
it should start with at least um, some acknowledgement that maybe this wasn't the right path, some sort of contrition as opposed to- Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But the first, the first thing is you have to get them talking about what it is that they're, they're into and, and then acknowledging it. Um, if we just going to sort of attack them for having that belief, then the walls go up and you, they get ego defenses go up and, and you don't get anywhere. So the way we get around, bring the people around to accountability because at, uh, when I was with Life After Hate, um, not anymore, but in, in the work we do, we always try to bring people around to accountability and, and atonement for the things they've done. But it's not necessarily always the thing that we start off with. Right. And I, I, we spoke before, and I think you said that it's, it's not just about forgiveness and, and, and trying to get that person out of there. You have to hold people accountable for, Absolutely. especially if, if they've committed actual crimes. It's not a matter of hugging it out. You have to take serious no, it's, action. It's a, it's a combination. Um, in the work I do, it's a combination of compassion combined with healthy boundaries and consequences. Okay. And the two together uh, can be very powerful. Okay. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna move on here one more time. Here we've got Carter Smith. Uh, he's a professor at, now at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, he before that he spent uh, 23 years at CID, which is basically Army Law Enforcement. Um, uh, he got involved in tracking white supremacy after the 1995 uh, Fort Bragg shooting. Um, I, I want to get into that kind of like what is some of the history of these laws and policies here. But first, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience on like, um, what if someone is uh, is discharged for after being an active member of an extremist group? Then does the military commanders alert local or state agencies? Or and I but I think there's a lot of questions, Carter, around like what happens to people if they're not convicted of a crime, uh, but they found they they have been found indulged in, in, in some of this activity? That's a, that's a great question. And one, in fact, that I often solicit when I do surveys of gang cops all over the nation, when I go talking to various different groups. Um, it's also one of three areas that I will probably identify the problem, air quotes, as the United States Constitution. Uh, because we have this ability to associate with those that we choose to associate. Uh, and we cannot be prohibited by law from doing that unless there's a crime attached to that association. So what the, uh, what the military does generally, and the Army specifically, because they're the lead agency because they have the most troops, and the other branches turn to them if you have a question, um, they don't have the ability. They don't have, there's no way, with or without the current infectious disease issues that we have now, with or without politics, with or without a war zone, with or without anything, there's no way that the, the, the manpower is available for them to A, track down every member of every group that could have issues, whether it be street, street gangs, outlaw motorcycle gangs, or domestic terrorist extremists. And part two of that is they don't have the manpower to be able to call Timbuktu, Kalamazoo, Salt Lake City, Miami, Florida, Hialeah, Dade County, what they don't, they, there's no way they can exit brief every single command or in every single community that's receiving one of their suspected hate group members. A, if they haven't committed a crime, you're probably violating their rights like it's going out of style, which is kind of what we wanted them to stop doing at, at some level. Um, I do ask the question and a lot of people think they should but it's, yeah, having been there, I can just tell, and I'm not a military apologist. They pay me to breathe. I'm retired. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, I, I'm not trying to explain something they wish they could do. I'm telling you, they don't have the ability. They, the right. funds would not exist. My taxpayers' dollars would not go there unless I was arguing hard against it. So, um, but at this point, and there, there is a certain history here, but you're not allowed to be an active member of one of these groups, but um, we're still quibbling over what it means to be an active member of these groups, right? Sure. I mean, if, if you and I are both members of the same organization, whether it's, your, whether it's your station or whether it's my university, active members means we show up for work. Active members means we wear the we wear the sorry we wear the logo on our shirts active members means we talk to other people about joining it doesn't mean we've got a membership card sitting in our wallet and we sit on it when we when we have dinner or something like that 
although it could be interpreted to be that way if you stretch it a little bit. But the reality of it is, back to the Constitution, um, there can be a law, and, and I, I, have my, I have my concerns about the current laws anyway, but there can be a law that says thou shalt not do A, B, C, D, E, and F, but if nobody's ever prosecuted for it, that would probably be a clear indication that the foundation of the law is not very solid. And I'm not sure how many, how many people have ever been prosecuted for being an active member of a hate group. Now they've been kicked out of the military, don't get me wrong, but oh, almost a decade ago, I suggested that the Pentagon stop saying, don't be an active member and start saying, if you are an active member, we will pull your security clearance that fast and you can't have a job without a security clearance. And they're doing that now. They've been doing that for going on, I think about four years. Um, that's, the, that's the way around it. If, if you gotta find a way around the constitution, by golly, that's the way, because without a security clearance, you're unemployable. Have a good life, nice knowing you. I, I suppose that it. true, but um, I don't know. I always talk to people who uh, uh, are, are in the military or veterans and they say, you know, the military owns you at this point. You don't have a constitutional right to be in the Marine Corps, and if they they want to uh, if they want to get you out of there, they they have a way of doing it. I, I did want to um, get us. I have a statement from uh, uh, Naval Criminal Intelligence Intelligence Service, basically the Navy's version of the CID. Um, they, they didn't want to participate tonight, but they did give me a statement. NCIS, they say, investigates crimes associated with domestic extremist organizations when there is an apparent or suspected federal violation, identified violent extremist ideology, and an active service member or current DOD civilian employee who has expressed an aspiration to further the identified violent ideology by threats active violence or other enabling criminal activity. And then when those investigations result in a determination that there is no crime evident, then the uh, information is passed along to appropriate commands for administrative actions hmm. where deemed appropriate. So that's kind of like the nutshell of what they do. And, we, oh, and I can tell you that, with, huh? uh, there you go, very lawyered up. But <laughs> uh, so NCIS, I can tell you, they reported to Congress recently that they have 14 active cases right now and they were all referred to them by the FBI. Anything else that they've received, they have simply pushed down to commanders to have them take action. Yep. Um, and it's it seems to be it's uh, pretty inconsistent on, on what happens to people when they leave. Do we even know what happens to people if they're not uh, if they're not actually uh, charged with a crime? Steve, they, may I, may I say something really quickly? Cameron, I I think I think a very easy way to fix this <clears throat> and. Uh, instead of dancing around it, simply add a new article and update the uniform code of military justice. That is a very quick and easy way to take care of this. Once that's done, then there's it's black and white, and that adds to what articles you are charged under, and that's just what needs to happen. From a policy standpoint, that is what needs to be updated. You, you wanna see a um, added to the uniform code of military justice, basically the law in the military that uh, a dis domestic extremism charge. Yes, absolutely. Carter, you're also an attorney, by the way, among your yeah, other. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not for additional laws when we aren't enforcing the current ones. Uh, I th I've, 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 I've been interviewed by a lot of media outlets asking me about enhancements, this and all. Yeah, we're not we're not doing what we can with what we've got. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Uh, we're not going to get prosecution for for thought. We only get prosecution for behavior. Tony's point, and I and that's that's amazing. Uh, that's that's interesting on how you change people's thought. I, as a criminal investigator, my past, we don't have time to change your thought. I just want to I just want you to pay a penance for your behavior. How about this? You behaved in such a way that violated the law. I'm going to arrest you. I'm going to incarcerate you. You're going to pay the price. You're going to go before a judge, however that works. But change behavior, that's, that's on down the road, totally out of my wheelhouse. But what's in my wheelhouse is identifying the behavior, seeing if it aligns with the law as we currently know it. And if it doesn't, I move along. And that's, that's kind of like what all those $50 words the Navy wrote, that's what they were saying. We've got an investigative purview. If, if, it's not, if it doesn't reach this threshold, we've got other things, not maybe better, but we've got other things we must do and we, by golly, aren't getting paid to spin our wheels and do nothing. And, All that's, right. and, that's, and that's honestly what it looks like.
But is, is there a consistent message? I mean, you're not supposed to be able to be the member of one of these groups, correct? Why not? You're not supposed to be an active participant. Isn't that the policy already? You said you, you went from member to active. Oh, you sorry. Me, that's, and I, I'm, I'm demonstrating, obviously, the issue. But that's always the issue. Pick an organization that we say is no longer something you should be a member of. As long as you don't exhibit membership, you're good. But it's thought, not behavior. That we're that we're trying to police. It's not we can't police thought. Constitution again. Well, right, but um, and this came up actually before Congress um, and again uh, Jackie Spears committee, uh, where there was an Air Force commander who was given a letter of reprimand and then reduced one in rank uh, after he was found uh, fundraising for Identity Europa, which is one yeah. of these extremist groups. Group. But he was allowed to remain in the military. Of after he but after he was found fundraising for of one course. of these groups, isn't we, that I'm, active I'm not, participation again, under their own state? Right. I'm saying it's done. Back in back in the late '90s, we were sitting around one day after a long day at work. You know how you have brainstorming sessions with people you work with? There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. This was in the infancy of identifying these criminal groups in the military. I know if they joined the military, they probably had a felony on their record. And this was back when they could actually not report it to their recruiter and nobody would know because they'd come in under a fake name with a bogus date of birth or whatever. There was no national agency check conducted in order to get people in. You could do it, but it cost extra money. The army wasn't willing to pay. So they would literally join in the county next to them where they'd never set foot. And when the recruiter there said, have you ever committed a crime in this county? They would say, no, how can I commit a crime? I've never been in this county. You could come on in the army. Right. And so we went, we just, and we, that was a fact that, that was happening time after time after time. So we started doing background checks on people that had 88 tattoos, 88 for Heil Hitler or any other indicators of their supremacy or gang activity or whatever. And lo and behold, wow, he's got a criminal record. We'd pair that up with what he said to his recruiter and they checked the block that said no, no, no prior felonies. And so we kicked, we, we identified 13 in 12 months, 13 of the, it was like fishing in a stock stream. And we presented it to the commanders and you know how many of them got kicked out? One. These were people who had no business in the military. They fraudulently enlisted and they wouldn't kick them out. He was my best soldier. He was the battalion commander's driver. He was the soldier of the century. He was, well, they didn't learn the discipline from you, Captain Barnes, you little arrogant to think that. Right. So where's the disconnect? Carter, where's the disconnect? With uh, uh, leadership. Why don't people, why aren't they taking this more seriously? Because, well, to be honest, the CID, just like the NCIS, has an explanation. And it's, to an extent, I could, I could probably argue it. It's not that big a problem. They say it's a low problem as long as it's less than 3% of our, all our felony investigations. What they aren't saying is that they've got way more irrelevant, relatively speaking, felony investigation. But if it doesn't meet the threshold of 3%, we're not going to call it a big deal. They have to report to Congress every year, but they don't have to pay a lot of attention. So every year they go to they go to all the agents worldwide, and I'm sure NCIS and, and Air Force OSI and the Marines do the same thing. And here's what they don't say, but here's the message. You know how we haven't been telling you to look for gangs and extremist groups for the past 12 months? What did you find while you weren't looking? Hmm. Huh, let me think. Oh, oh yeah, let me let me search. And if you're not coding it so you can retrieve it, and if you're not, here's the key, proactive investigation. That's what we did for three years. If you're not proactively rooting these groups out, getting people who are smart, like Tony said, who are smart on this, who just learn more, the more they investigate. And they're identifying criminal activity. It's like working undercover drugs or stolen weapons or whatever. These are groups, organized crime groups is what these are. And if we have drug teams and gang investigation teams, we should have these groups investigating. There you go. Proactive. I want to bring Heidi into this, who also has a really high degree of expertise on this. What are some of the solutions out there? I know you've talked about there has to be a much more comprehensive tattoo database, right? Well, I mean, I think Carter was hitting it right where the problem is. Yes, there's no tattoo database, so you're not screening out the front end. But if you don't make it a priority to root these things out, if that's not what you're telling, you know, CID, NCIS, everybody needs to be top of mind. And if you, if command isn't making it a priority, if you're not coding it, if you're not tracking, we don't even have data, right? Basically 
to tell us how serious the situation is. Um, from the things that I looked at, most of these things are handled at the unit level. And if somebody is exhibiting, you know, white supremacist ideology, tattoos, whatever materials, they get bounced out, but there's nothing recorded for why they were bounced out. So there's no record within the military of how bad the problem is. And, you know, the, the data that was turned over showed very few people being thrown out of the military. This was information given to uh, Representative Keith Ellison, like 18 people for extremism in the military in a, like a three year period. It's just, it, it's simply not possible that it could be so low. And then you look at that Military Times data where like one third of troops say that they see white supremacy on a regular basis and you can tell what the huge disconnect is. So the very top of the military talks all the time about how they don't want to have these kinds of people in the institution, that they're a threat in terms of domestic terrorism into the populace. But in reality, the way they're rooted out and handled is, is completely non-functional. And, and and you've talked about well the need need for a database. You need you've talked about um, um, yeah we don't know what happened with these with these groups when they don't actually face charges. So and and also and, and I think you've talked about this. Um, they don't work together. These different services, even though these groups uh, are more national and international than they've ever been. Well, that's exactly right. When someone gets tossed out of say the guard, like a member of Autumn Waffen did. There was no report made to the rest of the services that somebody from that group was active in the military, therefore might be recruiting other people into that. And yes, these are international in terms of the base and neo-Nazi group I mentioned earlier. Three guys were arrested on their way to wreak havoc at a gun rights rally. One of them was a Canadian military personnel. And in fact, we have had, we've had American neo-Nazis training in Ukraine with something called the Azov Battalion a super right-wing racist outfit that was getting money for a while from the US government for military training. So these links are international. And what we're doing is we're spreading skill sets that of course are very valuable, but not for these kinds of organizations across the world. It's a problem. All right. Anybody else want to chime in here as we come right up at the top of the hour here with, with what might help, what, what potentially is the solution here? Tony? Um, again, I think that I, th I think lead, the responsibility has to be put on it within the command structure and, and holding people accountable. And, and I think it's, it's not enough just to screen people on the way in uh, at their tattoos, but maybe there needs to be regular tattoo inventories after they're in. Um, and how good is the screening? at the front end when people come in through the recruiter. Uh, from what I was hearing from some of the testimonies that there's no policy for actually going through and looking at somebody's social media, which is where these groups are, are actually operating at this point. And I'd, I'd be hard pressed to get a job anywhere in the rest of America that, where I wouldn't get at least some sort of routine check of what I've been posting online. Am I right? There's no, there's no real policy here. Back in 2007, there was a, uh, I think a Denver affiliate, perhaps CBS, uh, that did an undercover operation in a recruiting office, probably also in Denver, as I recall. And they had a person walking in and, and you could tell that they were leading the conversation in such a way that they were a member of a, of a gang. And the, the recruiter said, well, that's in the past and all. And so I know you're over that. The guy didn't say that. Uh, but since that's behind you, let me get you in, in touch with my commander and we'll put you. And the, the assumption was made that this is not what they want to hear. This is the current military and the military of then and the military since Vietnam, if not during Vietnam's recruiting, does not brainwash people to the extent that you can remove the thoughts that you have in your head. Doesn't happen. You can't go in Catholic and come out Buddhist. It just doesn't happen. You can't go in right handed and come out left handed. So you're not going to go in with any of these mindsets, none of them, and come out all better. What I'll tell you, I think the solution is, is the commanders need to do a, a military version of what the police and, or the criminal justice system does called pulling levers. Pulling levers is when the community joins forces in all the criminal justice facets, they call gangsters and other criminals on the carpet. They walk them in and they say this as an example. Tony is an example of what happens when you do these things. 
he was facing X number of years incarceration. He was facing this, he was facing this, he was facing this. Tony, go ahead and tell him your, tell him your, your history, your path. And then you tell them, if you don't go in his direction, the other direction will result in decades of incarceration. It'll result in this. It's a threat brief is what it is because you're not going to change their thought. You can only change their behavior. It's the same thing. How many of us growing up had, had things in our head to, that we didn't say to our parents or our grandparents or our neighbors or our teachers or whatever? You learn to do this, right? You can think it all you want, but don't say it. It's unacceptable in a civilized society or however you want to approach it. And we are going to deal with a variety of people, diverse group all throughout the military because it's a, it's a microcosm of society. That's not changing. But what we can tell them is what's acceptable and we can tell them what isn't acceptable. And if you, if you cross that threshold, you will be kicked out and will prosecute you if at all possible. And, 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 and you will Carter, hurt you more than it'll hurt us. Carter, while, while, while those are excellent points, I like something that you said. Number one, when we think about this, it starts with commanders. I've Absolutely. seen this my entire career. It just starts Absolutely. with the commanders. It's yeah. just like in a home. It starts with whoever is the head of the house and who condones that. You teach people how to treat you. And if the commander is the one who's allowing it, then right. it will never change. Senior leadership is, is at the forefront of everything. That is how it all works. It starts with the commander. If, if he or she is out front and saying, this is not what will be tolerated, then the culture will truly change. Right. If the culture doesn't change, then all of these... Uh, Fringe groups feel emboldened, and the, right. and that's where that's where it starts. Cameron, thank you, Cameron McCoy. You're you're going to get the last word on this, and uh, you know, and a really nice last word. And so I want to thank my guest, uh, Tony McAleer. His book is C "The Cure for Hate." Carter Smith uh, with uh, Middle Tennessee State University, and Heidi Barrick with the co-founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, and then Cameron McCoy with the Air Force Academy. Also, Kim Young McLear with the uh, with the Coast Guard. I want to thank all of you for coming to these events. This has been one of uh, 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 is one of the many visual uh, virtual events we're doing here at KPBS coming up October 1st and 2nd. We have the GI Film Festival in San Diego. Check that out. Uh, okay, now we're going to go into some overtime with our panelists. If any, anyone wants to stay behind and uh, get a few more of their questions answered. All right, I think we're now in our official overtime here after coming up at the top of the hour. And so again, thanks to everybody. This was this was great. And it's like, I, I need to cut this off, but I can't cut it off because this is such a dynamic discussion. But I wanted to, th we've got a couple of questions out here um, uh, from the audience and is, uh, can you measure the adverse effects of racism and, and white supremacy on our failure in uh, human rights violations in Iraq and in other countries, the fact that we have these these domestic threats that are that are a part of our military, um, does that lead to how our troops end up behaving uh, around the world? Does it contribute? Who wants to take it? Oh, it's a big one. Uh, measure measure no influence no doubt. Mm. Yeah, I I could and connect the dots with that one, but I'm sure it does. It, like Cameron said, the culture dictates how we do and don't behave overtly and covertly. And so if back home, if, even if it's back in the States, if I see this going on that where they're allowing criminal groups of any color, race, creed, national origin, whatever, if the, if the commander's allowing these organizations to subvert his leadership, and then we deploy I'm going to assume that that not only that commander, but that commander's replacement, all the people that were under that commander, that they're going to allow the same kind of thing. It's 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 inevitable. I'd like to add to that that I believe the level to which we dehumanize other human beings is a mirror reflection of our own internal disconnection and dehumanization. And so people that are engaging these ideologies often are internally de dehumanized. And that dehumanization can't help but spill over into other asset, facets of their lives and the decisions that they're making uh, when on active duty. Cameron? And that's well said. That's well said, Tony. Um, just it's a it's a not even a reflection. It's a projection of one's inhumanity. 
it's it's just a it's just a projection of that of of how you treat people i i there, there's a lot that has been said and it's been awesome and and heidi and carter and tony have mentioned some great things but as we know and when we look at our own nation at this time we can clearly clearly see that people take their cues off of leaders and that and that is just such a clear indication of how we respond and how we are emboldened or how sometimes we cringe in in someone's shadow or how we can flourish outside of their shadows and, and that's what i see mostly with this is just you are you you are give you're you're motivated and cultivated and how you package and deploy the information you receive is a clear indication of who is enabling you. And I, I think there's a follow-up question here. Is the military is military leadership more tolerant of white supremacists than let's say other threats like street gangs? Great question. Um, that is I a good question. Yeah, I don't know that they're more tolerant. I know that the numbers, if you just have an evidence-based investigative strategy, the numbers consistently say that since they've been counted while they weren't looking in 2002, there are significantly higher reports of street gangs who, by the way, are traditionally in America and the military, African-American and Hispanic. Don't let anybody lie to you. Um, the white guys are either outlaw motorcycle bikers. Or I was going to say, I'm in Southern California in Ocean Beach, which was one of the hubs for uh, for the Hell's Angels. So, exactly. so there, are, there are white people in gangs. Trust me on that there, one. There are, but they're not in street gangs. They're in biker gangs. So, and it's a different it's a different mindset. But by, but street gangs by and large are reported. I think at some level because they're recruited more from teenage years. And they haven't matured in their ability to conceal their affiliation, perhaps, but that's another conversation for another day. But the reality of it is numerically, domestic terrorist extremists in 20 years have not pierced the, the top 10% of, of all the numbers. So if they if they were high, if they were investigating them with some with with, with some uh, uh, apparent bias, it would be justified if that makes any sense. I just wanted to add in here, I mean, the one thing I will say is that for most of the uh, Bush's presidency and Obama's presidency until 2011, the military fought very hard not to tighten up the regulations to cover things like social media, things be beyond membership in a hate group. I just know that because when I was at the Southern Poverty Law Center, we were in a running battle with the DOD over these issues. Um, writing letters to them, them telling us we were making up a problem that didn't exist. Uh, that changed, right, when the regulations were updated late in the Obama years. But I felt like through that time period, unlike how it was under Reagan with Casper Weinberger or under Clinton, that there seemed to be this um, willful blindness about white supremacy. And, and I also think now, because we don't have good data, we just don't, ultimately we don't know, right? And it may be the case that gangs are the bigger problem. I could totally see that, right? Or motorcycle gangs or whatnot. But why not collect the data? Why not have it so you can, so we can actually find out what the deal is here? And I wanted to ask that, and I think you've been asked that question before. And I, I put this out to the panel. What makes this threat different from, from gangs or, or some of these other threats? What is specifically about white supremacy that I think Carter at one point, you call it a drop of cyanide. Um, but Heidi, starting with you, what makes this threat different? Sure, well, what I'm concerned about with white supremacy are mass casualty attacks. That's what I'm most, that's the highest problem that I see out there. And that means um, either veterans or active duty serving people killing lots of people in one incident like Timothy McVeigh did right in the mid 1980s which had then been the largest terrorist attack on American soil, of course, before 9-11. That's what I'm, I'm concerned about. We also don't have any data, for example, on how many veterans or active duty serving military have been involved in hate crimes in the United States. The Department of Defense, like every federal agency, is actually by law required to report hate crimes and doesn't do so. Now, that doesn't make them unique. The FBI, which collects the data, only started reporting it about two years ago. But that's another dimension of data that we don't have that would help, like good climate surveys would, 
to find out what exactly the level of sort of racial and hate violence is within the within the military ranks. Why do you think there's a reluctance, especially since some of this data, you know that they do collect, right? I don't understand it. It should be top of mind. I mean, we've got every federal agency from the FBI, the DHS, the National Counterism Terror Center saying white supremacy is the number one domestic terrorism threat in the United States. So we certainly wouldn't want anybody in the military or after the military fueling that problem, right? I don't, I don't know why it's not top of mind. Hmm. One, one, of the fears, one of the fears could potentially be faith and trust that is lost and confidence that is lost in our military. And I think that is something that is very fragile because the military has struggled at times, especially during unpopular wars to justify its existence and why it serves to protect and defend. And many times that that is not always portrayed. It's not always communicated clearly. And I think one of the fears is that if that data is collected, Heidi, that it would reveal so much and that people would lose maybe faith, trust, and confidence in the military. And I, I really, I think that that is one of, one of them, just um, to have it so out, out for it. Isn't that I a think, fancy way of saying that they would be embarrassed by this and they don't like being embarrassed? <laughs> Who does? No, no one likes being embarrassed. Well, I mean, I find that interesting and I can see where that comes from, but of course you can't fix a problem if you act like it yep. doesn't exist, right? I mean, it just, for anybody, right? And I keep being told on many fronts, uh, embarrassment is the driver of change. First, you have to, to get in there and you have to show that there's a problem and, 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 and then the military reacts. And I can speak personally that um, vulnerability is, uh, <laughs> is the key to, to change. And while that, that fear might be very real that it would undermine uh, morale in the military, I think it would have actually have the opposite effect if the military t uh, took ownership of the problem and and did things to correct it. I think you would you would overcome that potential fear that you would think would happen. And isn't it trying? Like I think the Secretary of Defense is tried. The first step has been about eliminating pictures. So it may we may not like the speed of it again. I'm with Heidi. You, we may not like the speed of it, but we can't can see that's happening. And, I, and it's always tough to be in that type of position. Um, so th this, and I, I keep asking you this, and I guess in one way or the other, but is this all falling on recruiters for the most part to try oh, to figure no. out what all this? No, no, no. Well, no I don't, no, I don't no. think so. Every, you don't think so? Every so, CID report that ever comes out says recruiters should be in touch with local law enforcement. Recruiters have no business contacting local law enforcement because yep. they'll have a false sense of security. Local law enforcement should never, I don't know if they do, I don't think they do, none that I've ever talked to have ever said they do. Re local law enforcement has no business answering a recruiter's question when they say, is this fella a gang member or a hate group member? Well, the only thing they can ask for is a criminal history check. Right. These guys are smart and gals are smart enough to keep their identity secret while they're in the military. They didn't just learn that in the military either. They learned to fly under the radar. A recruiter is going to have a false sense of security. They're going to see a, tat a tattoo. The guy's going to say, oh, I got that when I was young and stupid. I would have it, I would have it taken off, but I'm allergic to needles or whatever. You know, and no, they, they need to polygraph people if they're coming. My solution is you want to come in the military and we know you are in that group. First of all, we're going to record you talking bad about your, 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 your leader. Talk about his mother. I don't know something embarrassing. And then if you ever flip back out, we got you. We'll polygraph you every three months. We'll do a psych eval every three months and we'll make sure you're serious or you don't come in. It's real simple. They'll never implement that obviously. But something like that, I think, keeps us from recognizing that we have always had these groups in our military. The first one was recorded in California in 1848 during the freaking gold rush. It ain't going away. These commanders take it as a personal affront because you tell them they've got a, these groups in their, in their military. How could it be in my unit? They're all over the place. They're at West Point for Pete's sakes. Two years ago, a West Point cadet arrested, come on. It's not going away. I don't care whether we, if we push it under the rug or we leave it exposed to the sun, it, it's not going away. We just have to control the behavior. That's it. 
So we, we've got one uh, uh, question here. The, the latest question is, uh, now that we've had this uh, presentation and discussion, what's next? What are we, are we going to do about it? I don't know if that's directed to me. I'm going to keep doing stories on it. Yes, I'm the it military is, reporter. It's directed to you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if that's directed to me, I'm going to keep writing about this, and I'm going to keep uh, doing stories on this. But uh, yeah, where do we go from here? Are we seeing changes in the law? Are we seeing actual changes in behavior here at this point, even though we've seen an increase in activity? Um, is there a thirst to, to do things differently? Well, I have to agree with Cameron. I was pretty excited about the banning of the Confederate flag and some of these things. I mean, that, that, that's a big deal. It's, it's yeah, a big it. shift. I mean, but I still think, um, you know, and what I testified in Congress on this is there's a whole series of reforms that need to be put in place to change this dynamic. The investigative services like Carter was involved in have to have this as a priority. They've got to have the resources to deal with this. We need more data. You know, I could go on and on about the kinds of, and I do believe if the military is serious about it, then, then they'll go about implementing, implementing those changes. This will be the last question. Zero tolerance. Um, th there's been talk of that. It's like, you have no place in this military if you're holding these particular views or if you're a part of one of these groups, an active member and active member has become, if we're talking about Boogaloo boys who met online and then within days were actually committing a violent act, it's hard to decide, I think, what, what an active member is. But, um, you know, what do we do from here? I'm, I, don't, I don't think zero tolerance is the way to go for anything, much less this because it's yeah. subjective. Um, and, and on the flip side, the devil's advocate of me says, uh, so guy, this guy has a, has a, 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 a thought or, or a foundational belief that you don't appreciate, but yet he's serving you very well in the military and he's not committing any crime right now. Why would you kick him out? Because we got a whole bunch of Americans that can't even qualify physically to get in the military. So the commanders are gonna push back on that in a, in a minute. And if we require zero tolerance, they will lie to conceal the fact that they aren't zero tolerant. Recruiters Carter, have been doing I, it for decades. Why wouldn't Cameron, commanders not change? Carter could, I, Carter, could I push back on that a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 that zero tolerance is really difficult for me, but I know that you can definitely, there's zero tolerance for um, sexual assault, right? You are kicked out immediately. Uh, there, there are some things that are zero tolerance. Uh, I, I struggle with this one because it goes back to what Heidi said. If the policies are clear and in place, it makes it easier. Uh, but Steve, to your point and to whoever asked the question, that's an excellent question, mm -hmm. but that's a slippery slope. If, if the policies are able to, to, to be implemented and they are able to be enforced, that's the problem. Like Carter keeps saying, we can't, have, like people just, the behavior, the behavior is a difficult one and the thought is a difficult one because people can always justify why they're going to give someone a second chance like Carter keeps saying. He keeps saying, well, I'll give them this because they haven't done that. Um, but if I can have zero tolerance for sexual assault, I mean, it is a possibility that there could be zero tolerance. Uh, but I, again, I like, what Carter said in the end, if you go zero tolerance, they cover it up and it's so difficult to then root out. Yep. All right. Well, again, I don't know why it is, Cameron, but you, you're ending up every uh, everything, including our <laughs> Q&A here. All right. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for doing this once again. I, this yeah. was... Uh, an incredibly important topic, and I'm, I'm really glad we were able to get it in. And this this was just an excellent panel. I really, I really, I don't like the topic, but I, I enjoyed the discussion. I can tell you that. Yes. All right. Thank so, you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you.